alcoholic. Uh, welcome to the Keystone Tuesday Night Big Book Study. This workshop is facilitated by Tony R. and Katie J. We will keep everybody muted during the workshop except for the facilitator. Please note that we will be taking questions after the meeting, so if you have any, write them down so you don't forget them, and we'll get to them afterwards. Any inappropriate conduct will not be tolerated, and you'll be removed by one of the co-hosts. Have a great meeting. How we open this meeting is with the set-aside prayer. Do you Can I have a question? No. Can you hold on to it, Martin? Dear God, please set aside everything I think I know about myself, this book, my disease, these steps, and especially about you, dear God, so that I might have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please help me to see the truth. Right on. Oh, all right. It's all yours. Uh, let me unmute here. Unmute. What's still going on here? Recovered alcoholic. My name is Tony. Sobriety dates April 8, 1989. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us. If you're com new, coming back, been hanging around a while, so it's going to be an interesting night. What, what we are is a big book study workshop of the program of recovery laid out by the first 100 men and women. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, I, I've been in the fellowship now 43 years, but I've been sober as the result of the application of the program that somebody took me through 32 years ago. So what was the difference, right? The difference is the application of the, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous from their experience and their understanding, and I obtained the same experience that they did. So I had the collective experience uh, of the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've never met anybody who's ever gone through this the way it's outlined and maintained it who's ever relapsed. So that, that's a pretty strong sa statement, right? I hear a lot of people say, oh, I, I went through it and I relapsed. Well, no, I, I don't think so. Well, how's step 11? How's this? Oh, I didn't do that. So you didn't maintain it. So, right? So you really didn't do it. Because if you really did this thing, then they, they talk about where we're at is we're at how it works tonight. And we're going to look at a couple things. And kind of like the theme is a lot of people are under the impression that they did this before. And relapsed. How many people were under that impression? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So so you, you know what the confirmation is that you didn't do this is? Is the relapse. <laughs> right? That's, that's the conf confirmation. If they're giving you another 24-hour chip, right, and you want to share about your experience, strength, and hope, we already know your story. Right? Yeah. How many people here has relapsed? How many people has informed the people around them that they never did this? I never really did this. We know. <laughs> we know you never really did this. How do you know? Here's your chip, right? <laughs> when they put your name on the plaque at a treatment center and you, and you got three plaques there, we know, right? You should walk around with I'm not a counselor certificate. And you, you ever notice, you know, we're, we're the first pre people giving everybody advice on shit we don't even know how to do ourselves. Anybody been there? Right? We've been there, and this, and this is a part of this thing. So we're going to kind of lead up. So we, we understand, um, if we kind of look at um, where we left off last week and, and kind of the idea here of we agnostics on page 44, we, we kind of um, uh, realize here that we, we learned a couple things, right? We learned about step one, and we learned about step two. Have we not? And now, now that we're going into how it works, we understand what they mean by the solution that they're offering us. So whose solution are they offering us? Our own solution or their solution? Their solution. Their solution. And whose understanding do I need of the solution? My own understanding or their understanding? Their understanding. I mean their understanding because they're presenting me the solution to the problem that they kind of explained to me. You hear a lot of people say, I did step one before I got here. Well, no, you could have suffered from step one before you got here. But in order to do step one, you need to concede to certain ideas being presented by those who went before us. And being a basic text on page 44, the whole design of this book, right from the, right from the first page when you open it up, where it talks about Alcoholics Anonymous, the story of how many thousands of men and women who have recovered from alcoholism, they talk about this story. I need to understand what this story that they're presenting here is. 
And the more they, they explain the story, then they somewhere along the line, what we're going to get to probably by next week, we are next week, is making that decision. Do I want this story? What story? The story of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not my story. I become a part of the collective. I have the same experience as everybody that went before me. I carry this message. So those who I sponsor can have the same experience. Kind of interesting, isn't it? So I'm not carrying my message, it's not my program, it's not my understanding. A lot of people sponsor that way. How do you know? Well, look at, look at how many people are still relapsing and don't understand alcoholism. My, my illness is doing push-ups in the parking lot. Like we, we separate ourselves by the basic understanding of this thing, that this illness, kind of what we read on, on page 44. You want to lay that on us? Uh, if everybody wants to turn there, we're just going to read the first paragraph. Okay, page 44, my name's Katie, I'm an alcoholic. We, uh, chapter 4, we agnostics. In the preceding chapters, you have learned something of alcoholism. We hope we have made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. So we'll just stop, we'll just stop there, actually, because we've gone through this in great detail. So you should know what type of alcoholic you are by now, correct or incorrect? Yeah. Or if you're reading this, you should understand what alcoholism is and isn't. Correct? And then you should also understand how many symptoms there are in step one that makes one an alcoholic. Right? And we understand that there's two. There's not three. How many people heard that there was three? Well, then we find out through the book there's only actually two that makes us alcoholic. Right? And the spiritual malady is not what makes one an alcoholic. How many people found that surprising when they went through this basic text? So where does that idea come from? It comes from comes from treatment centers. So there's a lot of treatment centers influences in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. So if we go back to the doctor's opinion, where there's nothing wrong with treatment centers, but it's not their solution isn't our solution. They may have a version of our solution, but very seldom do they actually do what's laid out in here. They have a version of it because it's not one size fit all within the treatment facility, right? Or people who've gone to treatment. And the doctor talks about that. How many people have been through the doctor's opinion here? Yep. So in his inter introduction to this thing, he kind of says, if you go right to XXV, he kind of talks about that, that he met this person um, a, a few times. But what was different upon the third time, third time going through treatment, Bill Wilson, one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, went through treatment three times, Right. What he noticed that was different the third time that wasn't presented the first two times was what? Was the solution that they talk about in this book. Mm -hmm. Somebody, which we understand is Ebby, 12-stepped him before his third treatment and asked him if he wanted to kind of go through with it. And Bill said, yeah, you know what? I want what, what, what you're demonstrating. And if I can get this by doing what you did, I'm in, basically, Right. And then he went to the treatment center for the third time where he was separated from alcohol, right? So, so he did the third step while drinking. He did steps one, two, and three sitting at the kitchen table. So we see that steps one, two, and three are really informational steps. And if you really do step one correctly, you should feel like shit when you've done it. If you feel good about doing it, then you've done treatment center step one. If you feel like shit after doing it, then you've done our step one, <laughs> right? Because our step one says you're going to continue to relapse. That's what you're admitting to. If you're powerless over something, it's going to continue to happen. And a lot of people don't understand it. It's like how many people has had dysentery here? <laughs> diarrhea. Diarrhea. How many people <laughs> experienced diarrhea here? So how about if you admit to your innermost self that you have it, does it change it? <laughs> How about if you accept it? How about if you surrender to it? Then I guess you're going to be pretty. <laughs> you're in a whole lot of shit. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So we see the acknowledgement of something doesn't change something, but it prepares you to look at a solution. Right? So the more you understand the problem, the better a solution would sound. And then it's like the doctor says, oh, yeah, man, if you continue to have this problem, you could actually die. So... We have this stuff as a modium. Here's a prescription for it. And here's how you got to take it. Knowing that, does it change anything? 
You got to get the prescription, make a decision that, yes, I want to follow through on this course of action that the doctor had offered me, which would be step three. The confirmation would be getting the prescription, step four, and starting the regime to get relief from the problem that was killing you in step one. Does that kind of make sense? So in here, the doctor's talking about this certain type of person, which which is the alcoholic that has placed himself beyond human aid, one who has suffered from alcoholism, which we see is different than a problem drinker, right? Or a heavy drinker. Because a lot of people who've gone through treatment are able to reconstruct their lives. Anybody know people like that? Mm -hmm. They just don't drink. Like these mainline speakers talk about that. They, they did some certain act, and no matter what, they don't drink under any and all conditions. Anybody hear those people? So they make you sound, it makes it sound like this illness is, is just about exerting yourself not to do it. Just don't take the first one. You won't get drunk. Stay out of the parking lot. All that, that, that I call it bumper sticker slogan sobriety, catchphrase shit that does nothing for people like us. Right? It's sound bites. It sounds good, and we pick up those sound bites. Anybody ever do that here? Hear something really cool at one meeting and go share it at another meeting? And if you're really impressive, you should end up with your first date by the end of the meeting. <laughs> oh, anyways, we'll leave that one alone. <laughs> I was young when I got here. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Everybody's shaking their head. <laughs> so we'll leave that alone, right? So he notices upon his third treatment that he acquired certain ideas. And what was the ideas he acquired? The same ideas that were passed on to Ebby that he put in the application that had this profound change that revolutionized Bill's ideas about miracles. Because there was one sitting across the table. So what was this thing that they talk about, if you want what we have, is the demonstration of this solution by those who went before us. Right. And so these people, we know these people when we've come to meetings, we hear people. There, there's a guy named Jack when, when I first sobered up in Vancouver. And, and, and this guy would like his reputation preceded him. But he was not the man that we heard about sitting in that meeting. He was two different, seemed like two different people. But in fact, it was him. It, it was a total transformation. And it was kind of mind boggling. The person that we seen compared to the person that we heard about. So see what I'm saying? So when we come to meetings and you hear people share, they say, this is what we used to be like. The inability to get sober. And when you drank, the havoc, the pain, the agony, anybody? Right? Mm -hmm. So we hear a lot of step one meetings, which are problem-based. Anybody been to those meetings? And you feel worse leaving than when you got there. Anybody? Yeah. You didn't feel like slashing before you went, but on the way out, you're constantly. (laughs) So it's not a solution-based meeting. And then you go to these meetings where they're more solution-based, right? That means they're not problem-based thinkers. That When they get up and they share about the application of certain ideas or spiritual principles, and these people just seem inwardly different. Anybody remember those people? And if you're not a very happy person, they could bother you when they share. Oh, here comes that person again. They're going to talk about the solution. They're going to talk about God. Oh, my God. I can't believe they're asking him to share again. All that person does is talk about a solution. It makes me, <laughs> really, really bugs the shit out of me. How many people have been to those meetings? Is there, because we like people with a problem. And we're hoping that there's somebody there with a worse problem than us. So we can feel better that we don't have that problem. <laughs> How many people have been to those meetings? Holy shit, I thought I was bad. Look at that person. Boy, I'm feeling better. That's not the idea of meetings is to find somebody worse than you to point out to feel better about yourself. But if you're not solution-oriented, that's what you do. So here, this doctor notices. Let's look at it here, doctor's opinion. In, his third, in, a, in the course of his third treatment, you see that? After the letter there, I think it's like the third paragraph. There's the letter and then the second paragraph. Okay. Mm-hmm. No, XXV. Read it. The doctor's opinion, first page. Okay. Um, I don't know where we are. Okay. See the letter to whom it may concern? Doctor's opinion, first page. 
Yep. Okay. Okay. That's, so that's take a big sweet. breath. <laughs> <Go try. laughs> Good to see you, Katie. How are you doing, man? You, 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 you where your feet are now? You here? Okay, good to see you. Okay, ready? Okay, Big hum. Okay. okay. Uh, in the course of his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas concerning a possible means of recovery. As part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present this, his conceptions to other alcoholics, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This has become the basis of a rapidly growing fellowship of these men and their families. This man and over 100 others appear to have recovered. So this is the doctor specialized in alcohol and drug addiction. He was the chief physician. He witnessed this thing back in 1934. They're coming out with the fifth edition. The fifth edition. We're in 2021. The recipe to success hasn't changed. It remains the same. What will change is some of the stories, but the recovery will stay intact. So then we, we kind of reiterates what it was talked about on the success rate. The success rate is the same today as it was back then. The difference is less people are doing the application of this thing, just as it was back then. Of those who did this thing, 50% got sober at once. Of those that did it, not everybody who came to AA. A lot of people think, it says, of, of, of the alcoholics who came to AA and really tried, not of all the alcoholics who came to AA, of the alcoholics who came to AA and really tried, really tried what? This this presentation that Bill's this witness, or that he applied that the doctor witnessed. So he recovered at once. Ebby had a couple relapses, but he ended up dying sober. So it's, it is a, 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 a recipe for success. So what happens... As we go through here, on XXVI, two pages over, the, the doctor talks about something here that, that most people experience in the fellowship, but if they don't have good sponsorship, they wouldn't know it, right? Because most people are trying to treat... Anybody ever hear the topic irritable, restless, and discontent? <laughs> you hear a lot of people yep. talking about that, eh? You know who's talking about this? People who don't have a solution to their problem. Mm -hmm. Why are you irritable, restless, and discontent? Because you don't have a solution. Right? Or you're trying to be your own solution and you're getting worse. How many people, the more you try to fix you, the worse you got? <laughs> yep. Right? So it, it produces that, that intensity, that, that kind of out of my mind feeling because I'm trying to solve the human dilemma with the human dilemma. How many people's experienced that here? So the doctor's talking about here on, on uh, men and women. You see where they're talking about that here? XXVII? Mm -hmm. So he's talking about those who struggle with this thing, alcoholism, people who are without a solution. And so this kind of explains why we continue to relapse or people continue to relapse or people don't seem to get this thing because they haven't had the opportunity to go through this thing or apply it. That's why they're not getting it. A lot of people in this group has been in the fellowship a long, long time. But when they got presented this solution in this book, got taken through by somebody who had the same experience, they're still sober and they remain sober. What? Through this recipe. I see a couple of people on the screen right now, right? Miracles of mental health. That's what this whole thing is about, right? The impossible becomes possible. And who really witnesses it is not so much as us, is their families and the people around them. They experience all the promises and all this stuff. They, they, they Like the doctor witnesses things like, wow, something happened. And the people in our lives go, wow, something happened. But none of us, none of our family really experiences that. They experience, oh shit, something happened. <laughs> There's no wow. <laughs> oh my God, something happened again. So, okay, men and women. Uh, XXVIII, the uh, last paragraph. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. True or false? How many people like the effect produced by alcohol? How many people like the consequences associated with it? Nope. 
You notice it didn't say the taste. I drink because I drink for a fact. I don't give a shit what it tastes like. After a couple of drinks, it all tastes the same. Anybody? My wife's a normie. I don't understand the way she drinks. Right? She she asks me questions about alcohol that, that, that people like us don't ask each other. Mm-hmm. Like, she asked me once from the kitchen. She says, oh... I think I was sober at 25 years at the time. We've been married uh, 12. We've been together uh, 15 altogether. So she asked me, she goes, you know a lot about, you, you know, you go to a She goes, you know a lot about alcohol and all. I said, yeah. And I was almost proud of the fact, you know, I kind of said, yes. What question do you have for me? <laughs> I'm a professional. <laughs> you come to the right person. She goes from the kitchen. She goes, does wine go bad? There was a long pause. I said, I said, I don't know. <laughs> and who cares? I said, she goes, she goes, it's a little vinegary. I said, so? Like, she goes, what's the matter with you? I said, that's what I've been trying to tell you. <laughs> so we're different, right? Or, or you open a bottle, you finish a bottle. Who's of that thinking here? Absolutely. I, I, I'm telling you, if you stay sober long enough and you hang around with normies, You'll do shit that you never thought you would be able to do. It's like actually putting a, a wine cork back in a in a bottle. <laughs> and, and here's the trick: you gotta you gotta trim it a bit because it expands and then. <laughs> or or you'll open your fridge one day and you'll see a glass half a glass of wine there with cellophane on it, and you'll be dumbfounded. Right? That's the, how she drinks. Right. I go, excuse me, what, what, what are you leaving that much in there for? She goes, oh, I didn't like the way it was pairing with her dinner. I thought, I thought okay, you know what? You're making me upset inside. <laughs> no. So, anyway, so we drink for effect, but we don't like the consequences. Because if you could still drink with effect, it doesn't matter how much you drink. The more we drink, the better. We like we like volume. How many, any volume drinkers here? Yep. Yeah. It's like, the more I could drink, the better. Right, if I have to stick my fingers down my throat to get rid of the foam because the night's early, I'll get rid of the foam and we'll continue to drink. <laughs> Anybody here? I just want to make sure I got the right crowd. You know, <laughs> I, I remember when I was a kid, like a kid 15 or whatever, and I'd get sick or 14, I'd get sick from drinking, and I didn't want to drink again. It'd be a big event, and then as I got older, I'd just kind of turn my head to the side and kind of throw up, clean my mouth a bit, wipe it on my pants and take a drink to get rid of the taste and keep on drinking like a professional. Anybody here? Anyway, okay, just making sure. So we like the sensation. Why? Because we get to be within our own skin. Anybody? That's why we continued to pursue it the way we did. But we didn't realize that there was something taking place. There was, there was a momentum happening not governed by us. Alcoholism was starting to create as one. It had us. It we didn't have it. It was determining my life without realizing it. The movies, the camping, the house parties. Anybody? Are we seeing what's happening here? Right. Okay. So now we're getting in shit. Right. We make a firm resolution. I'm not going to drink again. But I don't have a solution. But I'm going to be my own solution. How many people have been here? I'm not drinking. Should be easy. I'm feeling the pain of what I was doing and the heartache and all that other stuff. There's a lot riding on me not drinking. Anybody here? Yeah. So if you were normal or didn't have this problem, it shouldn't be a problem. Just get a bit of help, give them good reason. You should be able to curb that. We hear that in meetings all the time, don't you? Mm-hmm. You hear people who relapse. Oh, they've gone out to do more research. You just told me you don't understand alcoholism. Because people who come here don't go back out to do research. They didn't find a solution sufficient enough to keep them here. That's why they go back out. That's why we go back out. 11 years of in and out. That means I have 11 years of good enough reasons to come back. Anybody here? My life got so painful I had to come back. Where am I going to go? Burger King? Drive through recovery, right? I'll I'll take a bit of serenity with a half order of acceptance. and. <laughs> Second window, please. <laughs> That's how I used to treat it. <laughs> and then, anyways, you know what that kind of diet does for you, right? Anyways, we'll leave that alone. I was like, okay, move <laughs> on. <laughs> oh, boy. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, 
They cannot, after a time, differentiate the truth from the false. Anybody here? Yep. Hey, you're taking a couple drinks to people around you are concerned and you're wondering what their problem is. And they're trying to explain to you what your problem is and you punish them for doing it. Anybody? Or time to quit this job, time to leave this relationship, time to move. Cause not because I want it, is because I have to. <laughs> I assess the situation. <laughs> I can't change it. Okay, here's my notice. Okay, go ahead. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. How many people understand that? Mm -hmm. So most people, and, and it's hard to admit this until you understand alcohol, is most of us were in between drinks thinking we were changing our lives. Just because I'm in a meeting doesn't mean I'm changing my life. I'm just sitting in a meeting. Just because I'm talking about admitting you have a problem and conceding that you have this problem is two different things. I've admitted, yeah, I got a problem, yeah, you know, but I don't understand the nature of it because I still think I could apply me to fix it. How do you know if you're that type? Have you relapsed since making a decision not to drink again? How many times does that happen? So that's what they're kind of saying here. Like, if you don't find a viable solution, then the solution will find you, right? And what's the solution that finds us is a drink again. Does that kind of make how many people's experience? And that's what this doctor experiences in his treatment facility. And we've been experiencing that ever since. And the people that don't understand this is the people who don't understand alcoholism, which is two groups of people. Those who have never experienced it or those who continue to experience it and don't know why. Does that kind of make sense? So that's why the book talks about it. When we were approached by those with whom the problem had been solved. So our job as sponsors is to explain alcoholism and take them through the book. Remember by the time we got to We Agnostics, the whole purpose of that was twofold. One was to explain alcoholism from their understanding and their experience. Was it not? And also to explain the solution that they have found and the application that through their experience. True or false? So by the time I get to step two, I'm, I'm fully acquired with what step one is and what step two is. Right? And the confirmation of step one is we're going to read it. This is the confirmation of step one. A lot of people, and like, so each step has a confirmation to it, right? Like the confirmation of step two is step 12. The confirmation of step three is step 11. So that means step one has to have a confirmation on the basis of truth, wouldn't it? Because if it's making a statement, what, makes that say, statement truthful. Well, this is what the doctor's going to say in regards to this problem. So if you have a pen, you got to underline it because it's really profound. And most people just read through it or they never really comprehend it or, or have it explained in meetings. This is step one, right? Untreated. And what is that? Or unknowledgeable about the condition. Go ahead. A uh, sense of ease and comfort, comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks they see others taking with impunity. Without consequence. Isn't that the whole idea? Because most of us have consequence problems, right? How many people, how many of you guys in treatment here have more consequence problems than actual problems? I don't have a drinking problem. I have a consequence problem. Right? That's what gets yeah. my attention is the consequences. Because if I didn't have these consequences, I wouldn't have to be doing the shit I'm doing. Anybody? Mm -hmm. So most of us have a con and then when you hear people talk in step one, they talk about all the consequences, which none of that makes you an alcoholic. Those things get your attention. Because car wrecks, jails, institutions, hospitals are filled with people who are not alcoholics. How many people find that surprising? There's a lot of people doing life in penitentiaries who are not alcoholics and puzzle factories like on and on and on. Right? Those things don't make you alcoholic. They make you a bit of an asshole. 
but they don't make you alcoholic. That's what my sponsor <laughs> told me. He was very insensitive. I didn't like the way he talked to me. Because I used to say all these things. That, he said, no, they may be the consequences of a person who drinks too much. Because if you drink too much, how many people are prone to doing stupid shit here? Really stupid shit. That's why they call it impaired. The inability to think clearly. Most people learn from that. Like, you know what? After, after like, ho- watch this and hold my beer is not good statements for us. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got sober back in the days of polyester pants and fires, right? <laughs> they don't go together. <laughs> At the beginning of the night, he said, hey, Tony, do you think you're going to run through that bonfire when it's like six feet in the air? What, what are you, crazy? <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning. Yee-hoo, watch this. <laughs> Just we're not any. How many people have that? What were you? And then you wake up the next morning. What were you thinking? And the people are asking you, "What are you doing in this tent?" <laughs> no, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I, I just want to know my people are here. Okay, okay. Go ahead. So, okay. After they've succumbed to the desire again, as so many do. So they go on to explain what they mean by that condition, as so many do. Because they can't start like hammering the shit out of you here. It's a build up. First, they got to get their your attention. Because if they would have started here, well, because you suffer from a subtle form of insanity, you'd throw the book away, wouldn't you? I'm not insane. Don't take a survey of the people around you, okay? <laughs> Don't ask their opinion on your mental health. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's my version of my story and then there's everybody else's version of my story I like mine better we'll just leave it at that <laughs> mm-hmm. I remember my mom saying I said it didn't happen like that she says I was the only one sober in that situation <laughs> <laughs> you go ahead yeah as so many do and the phenomenon of craving develops they pass through the well known stages of a spree Emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. Anybody here? How many people remember the first time not to do it again? So, this starts to determine why we're different. Other people, like my girls, uh, one's 28 and the other's 25, uh, my daughter, they both had a, a stint, like one episode with drinking. I, they're so disappointed. I, I would have thought they would have worked on membership by now. But, I mean... Like, I couldn't get them to drink. They're amateurs. Like, it's just, just, it just, they, just uh, I was just hoping. My one maybe, no, no, neither one of them are like me whatsoever. One got in trouble when she was 19, drank too much, got in trouble. She'd never been in trouble again since. She's 28. Like, I've been, I've been to the New Year's party where I try to get them to drink more, and they don't. They leave drinks on the table. Like, they're disappointing. They're disappointing. <laughs> right? So my other one got in trouble once at a concert. She said, I drank too fast. And I was like hopeful. I said, maybe because, you know, she was being dragged out in a stretcher, right? The first day she says, well, I wasn't the worst one there. There was another guy getting arrested. 30,000 people. You found the one person to point at. There was hope (laughs) that made her feel better (laughs) than herself. And that was it. That was the last episode. Like, anyways, just so they're able to change or curb their life or stop. Anybody know people like that? Yeah. So given good those situations we've been in, it would have been enough to stop us. But what happens is now we're getting sober and the clock starts. I call it the sobriety clock. Tick, and it's internal. Tick, 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 tick. And the more that thing, the more 24 hours you get, the crazier you start to become. Not on the outside, because you've formulated this sobriety talk. You Five minutes before the meeting, you've gotten spiritual. You know, you just kicked the cat through the screen door at home and told everybody in your family where to go. Right? Right? Totally abusive. Nobody in this crowd like that, right? Total asshole at home. Right? They still, you still, you put the key in the door and everybody inside has a bit of anxiety to the condition you're coming in. But when you show up at the meeting, you got to light beam shining out of every orifice, right? You're just like you know, surrendering, let it go, acceptance, right? Anybody? But inside you're thinking, you're at home you're weaving a rope, this is the day. Nuts. Anybody that kind of nuts here? How long could you stay in that condition? 
Well, that's what they talk about. This is repeated over and over until what? Until they could have the sensation of that drink again. Drink they see others taking with impunity. The doctor witnessed this happens over and over and over. These people cannot find a solution within themselves sufficient enough to fix them with their own experience. Pretty wild, eh? So when you hear people talking in a meeting saying, irritable, restless, and discontent, they're giving you a cue of they don't have a solution to the human dilemma that they're suffering from. And unless they find one, they're going to drink again. So if you're looking for somebody to sponsor, that would be the person to sponsor. Because they think that's, oh, that's the condition of alcoholism, irritable, restless. No, that's the human condition. It's not one of the symptoms in alcoholism. A lot of people think that. Why did you drink? Because I was irritable, restless, and just going to... No, you didn't have a solution to alcoholism. That's why you drank again. Remember the other guy? Not a cloud on the horizon. He felt totally fine. Anybody here ever drink because when you were feeling fantastic? Yeah. And you shouldn't have drank? Anybody yeah. here drink when you felt like shit? Yeah. Anybody here drink when you just didn't feel anything? <laughs> I guess you're pretty much hooped, eh? <laughs> That's what they're saying. So you're there's so you're saying your condition's a condition that means conditioning, regardless of the condition you're in, <laughs> right? Yeah. How many people we, we're losing? A couple people. I know I'm pissing off a couple. You're gonna find something here today, either a resentment, a bit of hope, or or but you'll be thinking about us after you leave, right? Because you'll be sitting in a bar one day or somewhere going. Sons of a bitches. <laughs> and we'll be here for you. Okay, go ahead. Yep. Um, they pass through the well-known stages of, a, stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with the firm resolution not to drink again. That lasts about a week, right? <laughs> remorseful. The remorse feeling, you notice, it goes away the farther we move away from that episode. We have the keen ability to, to redefine the story to, to remove ourselves from it. Mm-hmm. We've numbed ourselves to our own story and our own condition. Anybody here? Anybody have moments where you have a full glimpse of your life and it's crippling? It's crippling. You have, and, and, and they call those moments, and we all have them, is a moment of clarity. Where you see yourself as the whole world sees you. And it's almost crippling. It's almost, it's like somebody is having a tug of war in your soul with barbed wire. You're buckled over and you can hardly breathe. You've got snot running out of your nose. And you have a moment with you that you cannot postpone or evade. How many people have been there? And, and the change in that moment is, do I seek help? Or do I hope to have another drink and this feeling will go away? And you know, that feeling will go away again. And it'll take life moments to get your attention again. Anybody here? And it, and those moments get worse and worse and worse because your life gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And you get more detached from the reality of your own life. And alcohol has you in its grip. Right? And that's what he's saying here. This keeps on happening. And there's nothing seems to stop it because every time it's going to be different. Every time I mean it, I mean it this time. I, I mean, I mean it. But he's saying he's witnessing here something very profound. And if you've, if that's been your story and it has my story, what needs to change to change that story? Because remember, the story of Alcoholics Anonymous is different than the story I'm experiencing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But they said... They used to experience the thing that I can't seem to get past, get over, and get through. They seem to find something. So this doctor is a witness to this thing. This is pretty remarkable. If So if you're kind of new here, this could be, or you've been struggling a while, or, or if you're just kind of not just happy, find that peace and contentment, mm-hmm. right? And and we we used to we used to call it eating nails and shit and bullets, right? Like I mean, like if you're kind of like like that, you're in trouble, right? Okay, go ahead. So the doctor's witnessing this continues to happen, right? Go ahead. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of his recovery. So that's the solution here. So we've gone through this whole thing. We're getting ready to get into step three. They said, I understand this condition now. I can see that I have this problem. 
that means that it's going to happen again. Yes or no? Not because I feel, it doesn't say, well, once you feel different based on yourself, you'll be able to stop yourself from drinking. It's saying it's going to continue to happen. Unless what happens? Until you hit bottom? No. Until until you have acceptance? No. Until you surrender? No. Until you have an entire psychic change, which translates into a daily reprieve. The daily reprieve isn't experience abstinence. A lot of people experience abstinence and thinking that's recovery, which really all you're experiencing is an interval between drinks. Right? You haven't experienced what they're talking about here. Well, what makes you say that? Because you haven't gone through this. What makes you say that? Because you can't show nobody how to do it. Wow. That, that, that's where you start getting real. So you know, all these people say, oh, I've done this. Good. Show me how to do it. Oh, <coughs> whoa, look at the time. time. <laughs> My sponsor did that to me. The guy who sponsored me here in Vancouver, when I ended up out here at 27, uh, ended up out here actually at 27, got sober at 29, right? He ended up going, man, you really sound like you got this together. I said, oh yeah, I've been, got it. Yeah, I'm even, yeah. He says, good. Show me how to do this. I said, do what? He handed me the big book. I couldn't show him nothing. Talked a good game. I was trying to do this the same way I did life. You know, you, you end up in a neighborhood. You find out who's who really fast, right? You end up in a bar. You navigate through. You find out you, those survival skills. You end up in jail. You know who's who real fast. You see who's moving proud and who's not moving. You, you, try, you try to use that same thing you did on the street in your life in AA, and it doesn't work. Because the people I'm attracted to in AA when I got here weren't people who were staying sober, you know what I mean? They were the only requirement for membership group. <laughs> but that's another, that's a whole different story, right? So, on the other hand. On the other hand, and strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, once a psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seems doomed. Doomed. Why? Because they're suffering from this problem. Mm-hmm. Who had so many problems, he despaired of ever solving them. So Suddenly, see how they separate the two things here. There's alcoholism that continues to drink against their will. And then there's the human dilemma. They're not one in the same thing. We don't treat alcoholism. What we have is a treatment for it. We don't treat it. Right? The illness is different than the human experience. It's, it's, it's something that we're afflicted with. And as long as it's present, we'll never be able to recreate our lives. Why is that? Because this thing in our mind keeps on happening, be it three months, six months, four years, five years, somewhere this thought will come to the idea that I really need a drink. Hmm. Anybody? So what they're saying here, as, as those that don't understand that once this psychic change has occurred, through what? Through this course of action, through one member of Alcoholics Anonymous carrying it to the next out. Alcoholic. You notice, did Bill find this message or did he have it carried to them? He had it carried to them. It's our job to carry this message to the alcoholic who still suffers. It's not their job to find it. They couldn't find their ass with both hands if it was attached to it. Because we don't know what we're looking for. Anybody here? We're looking for things that make sense to us. Property, money, prestige. Everything on the outside circle to make my inside circle feel good. They're saying, no, the inside circle needs a change in order for the outside circle. You need a total transformation that we read in the spiritual appendix in the back of the book. Have we not? Yep. Right? So, but by the time we get to how it works here, right, they're talking about here is that they're talking about on page, uh, anybody know where uh, how it works is? 58. Good, just checking. Seeing who is still paying attention here. <laughs> Kimbo, you still with us? Right up. <laughs> you got to check in with him every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in your first five years, sometimes we get carried away with the own voices in our head, right? So sometimes you got to go, hey, come back here, right? Be where your feet are. Nobody like that here, right? Right, Darcy? What? Yeah, what? <laughs> yeah. Took you a little while to join us today, didn't it? 
we do that. We just like, <laughs> we may be present, but the rest of us still catching up, right? So, so we get to how it works. There's a summary of the collective experience of everybody who's gone through this, right? Because they talked about here, by the time they did the four, they said the story of how thousands, right? But the basic of it, it remains the same. So if you were new and read how it works, you'd really miss most of it. Because it's really, really designed for those who've gone through it to remind us what this is about when new people are present. What makes me say that? Well, when my sponsor asked me, he says, when he went through how it works, and I'm going to hit some highlights here. Where he says, he says, what do they mean here, Tony? And this was 11 years in and out. This is how he was 12-stopping me. How he 12-stopped me is get my attention by acknowledging maybe I didn't know what I was talking about. But I didn't know that because everybody around me sounded the same as I did. Mm-hmm. Right? So we weren't challenging each other or whatever. So, And usually we don't like people to challenge us because they become assholes, right? We don't like people to know, right? My sponsor says, you know why you think that guy's an asshole? I said, why is it? Because now there's two of you that know you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right? <laughs> Anyways, you'll find that funny later. Okay, so... He goes, Tony, what does it mean? Rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. I I showed him the directory and I said 90 meetings in 90 days. How many people see that in chats and talks and people get told that all the time? New person here, 90 meetings in 90 days. What they're trying to say to you is hopefully somebody will grab your ass because I'm not helping you. Right? Hopefully somebody will get a hold of you in these 90 days and help you find a solution to the problem that's killing you because I really ain't got time. Right? That they're going to slough you off to somebody else unless they want to formulate a relationship. Then they're tripping over the person beside you to hand you the phone number. Anybody been there? <laughs> well, I don't know. When I got here, it was pretty. Like, I got a lot of different numbers from some, some cougars that were around for a little while trying to help me get sober. Right? <laughs> it's not just a one way thing here. I mean, I took those numbers. I, I needed all the help I can get. <laughs> That's a that's a different story, right? <laughs> Anyhow, I didn't know it was the spiritual path that they were laying out in step two to the solution that being presented in this book. So the information in here is the spiritual path. A lot of people say, here are the steps we took. Well, the steps is to get us on that path, right? I need to get to the path to get on it. And these principles are what keep me on the path. The steps are what gets me to the path. Right? Then they talk about here, as they go through this thing, they they talk about something here that a lot of people miss. It says, our story is disclosed in a general way. Go ahead and read that, Katie. Our story is disclosed in a general way, what we used to be like. What happened and what we're like now. So so on that piece of paper that you have beside you with a pen, if somebody was to walk up to you and say, what do they mean by that? What would you say? And you notice it says what we were like, not what it was like. Mm-hmm. What would you say when they say, what, 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 how would you describe that? What do they mean by that? What we were like. And what they're talking about is our inability to get sober mm-hmm. on our own. And when I took a drink, I triggered the phenomenon of craving, and I was unable to drink with impunity, without consequence, because I couldn't control the amounts I drank. And all the times I tried to get sober, I found myself drinking again, and in all kinds of trouble. And you could get into the stories, right, that we all have, but why did you continue to have the stories? Because this is what I was like. Did you think that this time was going to be different? Every time. Then I learned out that I had alcoholism or alcoholism had me. And it consists of these symptoms, which is the allergy and the malady that centers in the mind, right? That places me beyond human aid. That's what I was like. So what would you say the what happened part? Our stories are closed in a general, what we used to be like, what happened? Course of action. And what we're like now. So the, the what happened part is a lot of people would say, a lot of people say they're last drunk. Anybody ever hear that? They're last drunk or detox or treatment, this one situation, and they've been sober ever since. You hear them say that. 
And I don't drink no matter what. Under any and all conditions, I don't drink. And then and then you have your story. You realize, shit, I drink no matter what. I'm different than these mainline speakers that they've flown in from all over the world to make me feel even more like shit that I'm not getting this thing. Because all these people are meeting makers make it and they don't drink no matter what. And they have the gift of desperation. Man, I, <laughs> that was on my business card. <laughs> I am the gift of desperation. <laughs> And we see in Bill's story that if that those things would have worked, he would have got sober the second time in treatment. So we see, mm, so there's a different group of people in AA here. There's three groups of people. There are those that don't really need to do this, but they're happy staying sober because if they continue to drink, it costs their lives a lot of problems. So given good reason, they're able to stop. Right? And they get in service and they get help, right? And this is awesome because the only, but they're trying to teach us, us alcoholics, how to get sober when we can't get sober that way. Then there's a group of people who got sober through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is getting fewer and fewer in our fellowship. That's why we're getting back to the language of Alcoholics Anonymous contained in our basic text. This is their understanding. I come here for their solution or to find out what the problem was because I had nowhere else to go. So when I come here, I need the message of Alcoholics Anonymous carried to me, not some other bullshit thing being introduced to AA, like Drop the Rock, uh, Back to Basic books, like books that are not AA approved that are being offered to me as a solution in AA it is really irresponsible of members doing that. The first thing that should be offered to somebody coming to Alcoholics Anonymous is the message contained in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Anything other than that is irresponsible. Sponsor it's not even sponsorship. They're not even sponsoring. What they're doing is carrying their message and possibly killing people within the fellowship of AA coming here looking for a solution. Anybody know people who've died? Not as the result of doing this, I can tell you that much. But as a result of doing some other method that somebody else in their in their infinite wisdom has infiltrated or brought into the fellowship and have soft pedal this thing, and the alcoholic tries to put this thing, implement this thing in their life, and it doesn't work, and they don't get another chance to come back. Right? Some of us only get one chance or maybe two or three, but a lot of people will actually, like myself, will end up dying of alcoholism in AA. Until the what happened part is I got 12-stepped into a big book study workshop like this 32 years ago, puking green bile, 32 waste, unemployable, little jaundice, right? They want me to go for a psych assessment. I am seeing shit like I, I'm at the end, at the end, right? My brother, my uh, my younger, year younger brother, we died at 32 for full-blown cirrhosis of the liver. So... You know what I mean? So you see where I'm going here? So I sobered up at 29. I didn't have much longer. I was getting drunk on two or three beers. I used to drink a 40 plus. Now I'm getting hammered on two or three. Why? My system's shutting down. I'm puking green bile. So I'm trying to get this thing. So what happens then? I got 12 stepped into this thing. Got taken through this course of action in this book. Got introduced to a power greater than myself from their understanding that I formulated a relationship and an experience with inside of me that created a psychic change or spiritual experience, if you like, sufficient enough for me to recover from the condition I was suffering in. And from that moment on, I haven't suffered from alcoholism since. The problem has been removed. I suffer from the human condition I apply these principles to. What, what we are like now is I live by spiritual principles. I no longer deal with alcoholism. I'm still an alcoholic, but I'm no longer dealing with alcoholism because alcoholism is beyond my pay grade. I admitted that in step one, that it's beyond me to deal with. I need something greater than me to deal with it. That was the idea being presented here. Came to believe that a power greater self could restore us to sanity. By the time I get through this process, somewhere along the line of, of doing my step 11, working with other people and cleaning up my past, I'll have a total transformation 
where the problem gets removed. It doesn't exist for me. And I'll enter a daily reprieve from what? From this condition that's killing all those around me still. Pretty wild stuff, right? So that's what so what happens. So then we get as some of these we box we then they get here. Remember. Go ahead, Katie. Uh, okay, bottom of the page. Remember that we deal with alcohol. Cunning, baffling, and powerful. Without help, it is too much for us. Okay, so what's the most important right now? Uh, hold on, 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 on that piece of paper. Don't say it, Katie. I like your enthusiasm, though. <laughs> on that piece of paper, <laughs> write down the most important word there. Out of all those words, what's the most important word there? Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, and powerful. How many people put Remember. <laughs> Some people, it's kind of, so remember, you can't remember, remember. That's what they're saying. Because if it's cunning, baffling, and powerful, you won't be able to see it. It'll be like that that, that nutshell game, right? Can you see when the guy's flipping the cars? Double down, I'll take some more of your money. It's a shell game that you can't see. It's a condition in your mind that you can't see, feel, and touch. And when it becomes present again, the confirmation that it is drinking. So you, I hear people say, I was an alcoholic before I drank. Impossible. You have to drink to be an alcoholic. How many people find that surprising? Yeah, yeah. You may suffer from the human condition before you got sober and made alcohol really taste good as a result of your human condition because it gave you that sense of ease and comfort. So the alcohol treated your human condition. You suffered from the human dilemma. Remember, they talked about that back in, in We Agnostics. Why shouldn't we apply to our human problems the same readiness to change our point of view? So we're, are we applying these principles to our alcoholism or to our human condition? Our human condition to bring about a sense of ease and comfort, relief. So the insanity doesn't return. So then they get on here. They talk about here half measures of Let's Go ahead. Half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. Which is step three. Complete abandon. Look up that word this week. It's, it's not surrender. Abandon means to move in a new direction. Right? We have two alternatives. An alternative means as the result of something. Alternative mean means to continue on. Because I'm here because of alcoholism. I'm at that place in my life that I need a solution. And what got me there is alcoholism. So step one has already been taking place in my life that has me to a place of total unmanageability and collapse. What's the unmanageability? My inability to get sober. The more I try to fix me, the worse I get. So my story was already determined by the time I took acknowledgement of it. It's already been in place. Does that kind of make sense? Everybody around me already knew something I was the last one to figure out. Everybody already knew. Nobody was surprised but me after. Right? Step two says, or the alternative was to accept spiritual help. And we see as the result of a course of action, we get this change or transformation. This new course of action. Our GPS gets reallocated in a new direction. Because our GPS keeps us bringing us back to a drink. The more we try to not go down that route, we find these new paths and do all this stuff, take up yoga, things are fine, and get feng shui, and we're doing all this stuff, burning incense, life's fantastic. And then our GPS is leading us back to a drink, and we don't even know it. We take that drink, and we're baffled. Anybody here? Totally. And so as we start this new course of action, anybody ever been on with a GPS saying, reallocating, reallocating, anybody? And that would be steps one, two, three, four, because something's trying to escape, take you away, try to override this, this idea that you want to move in a new direction, but you can't get past your own thinking. Anybody here? Or the conditions within inside of you, you're haunted and perplexed. So they're saying, listen, Come with us. And as you go through this thing, somewhere along the line, your GPS will stop reallocating itself. 
It'll take you on a new route. And by the time you become aware of it, you've already been on that route for a while. So you'll see your life is, again, a byproduct of something greater than you. Mm -hmm. But this time it's a power greater than you. And your life will demonstrate that relationship with that power. And it won't be on the basis of irritable, restless, and discontent because you have a solution. We don't stay in that condition long. We do the application of these principles to bring about a change. We do the recipe that Bill talked about. We go find a new person. We get in service. We get in help. And we get relief from the things that we never used to get past. Right? What would save the day is continuous work with others. Right? Mm -hmm. Before Bill never get past that. So this is where they talk about here. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. I'm going to go through this really fast. When we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. They're talking past tense. If you're new, you're talking present tense. You are still. They were. Yeah. You need to get through this. And then they talk all these. If you look at this process, it all talks in past tense. The next page. Having had. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of doing step one and looking at step two and surrendering in step three, I didn't feel the necessary need to do the rest of the steps. Oh, it doesn't say that. Sorry. <laughs> but we hear that. We hear that, right? I want to get lottery sobriety. I want to get this without doing it. I, I want to say, say to myself, self, what do you think? I think I got this. Anybody? Here they're saying, having had a spiritual awakening as the result, one purpose, the result of these steps. That means I have to go through them to ha get into the same category as those who exp experience a psychic change or daily reprieve, right? So the daily reprieves not contingent on my ability to stay abstinent. It's on my relationship with a power greater than myself through the removing of this problem. Yes or no? Right? Big yeah. difference. Where did I learn that through here? So then if you look at the second half here of how it works, it talks about those who have had a transformation. The first half of how it works talks about the inability to get sober no matter how great the necessity or the wish. How relapse is inevitable. But through this course of action, they've entered a relationship with a power greater than themselves, had this psychic change or spiritual experience. And the second half of how it works is dedicated to practicing these principles, not practicing these steps. Practicing these principles to stay connected to source, to power that keeps me sober on a daily basis and carrying this message. Yes, no? So this week, yeah. what they talk about here after our description they talk about here being convinced we're at step three. We're at step three. They're going to explain what they mean by that. They didn't say figure it out. <laughs> did they? They're going to explain exactly what they mean by being at step three and what did they do. But in order to do that, they need to talk about the human condition now. Here they're talking about from page 60 at the bottom to 62 at the bottom. They're talking about the human condition and the solution they found for the human condition. And what that looks like. In order to move on to step three. So this week read that and see where the only time they talk about the alcoholic is in association to what. So a lot of people think they're talking about the alcoholic. No, they're talking about the human perplexities, the human dilemma. Yeah. And when they talk about the alcoholic, in what regards do they talk about the alcoholic in regards to the human dilemma? So read that this week. And, and, under, and what was the solution they found for them to have a different experience than the one they were having? Does that kind of make sense? And next week, we're going to do step three in a group. Hope you join us if you're ready. If you're not, it would be awesome. We'll go through it. But you got some homework to do. You need to be responsible for your own recovery. Our job is just to walk you through it in the light of our experience through their experience. So we're really guides. Who's really sponsoring you is, is the first 100 men and women. That's who's really sponsoring you. 
right? We're just guiding you through the same experience that they had by having the same experience. Pretty cool stuff. You want to freak people out? Next time you're in a meeting, say, well, my sponsor was was the guidance of the first 100 men and women. People lose their shit. <laughs> you had the first 100 men and women sponsor you? Yeah. <laughs> my sponsor guided me along their experience. So it becomes collective, does it not? So anyways, yeah, Rob, thank you, Katie. Uh, so that's your homework for this week. And, and then on Thursday, we're just finishing up a bit on some more 12 and these principles. We'll go through the rest of the book, hit some highlights. It's your job to read it. And and then uh, we'll start over the week after and on the fourth step on Thursday night. And then the week after Tuesday, so not next Tuesday, Tuesday after, we'll start from the beginning again. So if you're on these chats or you're uh, on working with people, let them know what you do. The what happened part. This is that's part of twelve step work because there's a lot of people out there looking for the experience that was freely given to you, wasn't it? And a lot of people's lives changed really through coming through a study like this, or actually anybody. They had total transformation through coming through this study, which is available for all of us. Like me, I went when I went through this study with those who in my life is to pass on what they passed on to me. And, or, and how you do that is let people know what you're doing. That's 12-step work. There's people dying of alcoholism in our fellowship looking for this solution that you're sitting in, enjoying. Let people know your experience. What has you sitting, enjoying life? Does that kind of make sense? Right on. Thanks, Rob. Thanks very much, Tony, Katie. Excellent job. The seventh tradition states that Alcoholics Anonymous is self-supporting through our own contributions. The contributions help to cover the group's expenses, but the seventh tradition is more than simply paying for rent and other group expenses. It is both a privilege and a responsibility of individual groups and members to ensure that our organization at every level remains forever self-supporting and free from that influences that might divert us from our primary purpose. The Keystone Group has been in operation 11 months now. And within that time, $10,415 has been sent to GSO in New York to keep the brick and mortar going at this very difficult time. For those that have uh, contributed to our PayPal account, thank you very much. For those that are looking how to contribute, the PayPal information is in the chat right now. So please take it down and give what you can. All the money will be sent to GSO in New York. Also, uh, we have a YouTube channel. It is Tony R. Vancouver. There are over 80 talks on there. Uh, it's a great reference guide, so please use it. Uh, also, the workshop worksheets uh, are there if you need them. And if not, you can get the worksheets from me. Uh, my email is roknox86 at gmail.com. I will put that in the chat again. Uh, don't forget that we take questions after this meeting, so stick around. And Tony, is there anything that I've forgotten? No, you're awesome, man. Except okay. closing with the serenity prayer. You better believe it. Who makes it all possible? God. God. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And wisdom to know the difference. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Thank you very much, Tony. Oh, tomorrow night, um, 